Well, welcome to everybody who is joining us online as well as those in person at NRH. I'm excited for us to continue the way of King Jesus. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Gospel of Matthew 6th chapter is where we're going to be. And uh, some of you uh, are, are tracking with me that like, hey, why did you just talk to NRH? Aren't we also going to talk to our other two campuses? Because we are one church in multiple locations, uh, three in fact right now. And, uh, and yet today we're having live preaching at all three of our campuses. In fact, the message that I'm about to preach to you, I worked on this with Chris Hatchett, our South Lake campus minister, and Jeremy Glover, our West Fort Worth campus minister. So they're standing in front of their campuses preaching this word today. Um, and so I'm excited for us to continue because we are going to continue a series in which we have been looking at Jesus's arguably most famous sermon in Matthew 5 through 7 called the Sermon on the Mount. And today is without a doubt, the most famous part of his most famous sermon. So before we hear these words, everybody, kids, adults, everybody in the middle, man, let's, uh, let's just take a deep breath before we hear these words. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Here we have a prayer that has been prayed for generations and generations. A prayer that has been prayed literally by billions in, in his book, How to Pray, Pete Gregg estimates that on Easter Sunday alone every year, some two billion people recite the prayer we just heard. It is a prayer in which, well, I love these words from French philosopher Simone Weil. She writes that this prayer contains every possible request. One cannot conceive of a prayer not already contained in it. It is to prayer as Christ is to humanity. She goes so far as to say, quote, it is impossible to say this prayer even once, giving each word the fullness of our attention without a change. Perhaps infinitesimal but real, happening in our soul. Jesus gives us a powerful prayer. Jesus gives us a prayer that reaches into every corner of his kingdom. Jesus gives us a prayer that is timeless. And yet for, for all of those attributes, it's also a prayer that you can say very quickly in a short amount of time and that even a child can learn to pray by memory. I know that because months ago, before I knew we were going to be doing the Sermon on the Mount in the spring, uh, before I knew I was going to be uh, assigned to preach on the Lord's Prayer, in my house, we started trying to reclaim what our uh, dinner prayer time looked like. Because most of the time, we kind of just did like a list prayer before dinner. We, we had a list of thank yous. Uh, and and that's, not, that's not bad, but man, we just kind of were like, okay, we're going to do something different. And so we decided... At, at, at our table with my, my five-year-old son, Finn, with my two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Imogen, with my wife, Courtney, with myself, we would say the Lord's Prayer. First time we started it, the kids really, they were not fans of this. Uh, they, they didn't really get it. My five-year-old especially was, was not on board. 
Uh, But over time, night after night, dinner after dinner, he started to kind of say some of it with us. Even even Emmy, my, my little girl, started saying a couple words until after a couple months in January. So I'm, I'm saying this to absolve my preacher guilt. I did not film this so that I would show you this, okay? I didn't film this this week. I filmed this in January at the beginning of this year and then found out I was preaching on the Lord's Prayer and I was like, okay, I can't not show this. So I've absolved my preacher guilt. Now I want you to actually watch this. Father in heaven. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day our daily bread and forgive us our sins and free forgiveness who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and the glory forever and ever. Say Amen. You say Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh. Sometimes I'm more like my son with a willingness to pray. And if I'm honest, there are other times when I'm a lot more like my daughter. I know that I should, but it's not going to happen. You know, I, I once asked friends online, to finish this sentence. Prayer is hard for me because. I got all kinds of answers. Here's some of the most common. Prayer is hard for me because I get distracted. Prayer is hard for me because I don't make time. Prayer is hard for me because I don't want to think about the stuff that I really need to pray about. Prayer is hard for me because it feels selfish to ask God for stuff. Someone was honest enough to write, prayer is hard for me because I don't know how to pray. I think at different points in my walk with the Lord, I've felt some of all of those things. Prayer is one of those aspects of believing in God and following God that is in one sense really like natural. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of people who in, in moments of crises, they, they don't have to be people who go to church to all of a sudden pray. Even if their prayer is to, to a God they don't really even believe in. And yet, and yet it's also something that once you get inside of a church family, prayer is more caught than taught. And so you kind of pick up how other people pray. You kind of pick up the words that they use, whether they change their tone of voice, whether all of a sudden they go full King James on you in the room, like prayer's a whole different language. And and I wonder if the disciples, there was something about the way Jesus prayed. Because they they, they watched him, they heard him. These disciples who who followed him in his ministry, there there were the, the, the 12, of course, but there were others, including a group of women who supported him, traveled with him, even supported his ministry financially. And these men and women, all of these followers who were most devoted and closest, there was something about the way he prayed. Because in Luke 11, the disciples walk up after he's been praying, and of all the things that they would ask, they say, Lord... Teach us to pray. And in that moment, Jesus gives them a version of what we just read. And yes, these words in some ways are are quite familiar. And yet imagine on that day, as Jesus, on this mountainside next to the Sea of Galilee, begins to teach and speak to them and to this, this crowd of people, including his closest followers, but even more than all those As he reads these words and gives a prayer that will help us, it's not so much that he's saying you have to say these exact words, although that's appropriate. It's not just that he's teaching what to pray, he's teaching how to pray. It's a prayer that gives us a sequence and structure for how to talk to God. And if you're taking notes, it begins with this, that when we pray, we acknowledge his greatness. When we pray to God, we acknowledge his greatness. The most appropriate way to begin in prayer is to start by pausing and realizing 
Who are we talking to? And in this opening line, Jesus tells us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're going to spend more time here than some of the rest of the prayer because if we don't understand this, we won't understand the rest of how Jesus believes prayer works. We won't understand the rest of how we're meant to pray. Jesus gives us words that would have been shocking to the disciples and to the listeners that day. In the Old Testament, God is sometimes referred to as the Father of Israel, but that's more as a concept. There is no one in the Old Testament anywhere who prays to God as Father. That's not how any individual should ever address God, at least that was the thought for the Jews then. But Jesus introduces a kingdom kind of prayer that helps us understand who is this king to us, this king on the throne, this king who speaks with authority over our lives. This king, Jesus says, you're talking to your father in heaven. Why is that so important? Well, it's because Jesus wants his disciples, he wants us to understand. We're not meant to believe we're talking to some distant deity who's not necessarily inclined to care about what we need help with. We're not talking to some supernatural, impersonal kind of force that if we're lucky and put together the right words as a kind of incantation, then we'll get the answer that we want. No, Jesus helps us see we are beginning from a place of intimate relationship. That's who God is to us, our Father, a Father who's in heaven. Now, heaven wasn't just about a location for God. It's really about his position of power. See, when, when we talk about the person who lives in the White House, we're not really talking about the fact that they live at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We're talking about the, the, the position in which they have power and authority over a people. And the upside-down nature of the kingdom of God is that when we speak to God, we have this connection with a God who is over all of creation, all of the universe, with absolute authority, the strongest, greatest God over all, who is also our dad. Here, let me, I, I, knowing this was family worship, I was trying to think of a way to, to, to help us recapture the wonder of the reality of prayer. And as a kid, there was something that sort of grabbed my attention of the wonder of being able to speak to someone in a unique way. And it was when you got a string or some, a little bit of, 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 of wire or twine, and then you were able to connect them with two, two cans or two cups. Do, do any kids in the room know what I'm talking about? Have you ever made one of these? Do any big grown-up kids in the room know what I'm talking about? So here, uh, Patty, if you'd grab that microphone. So here, here's, what, here's what I'm talking about. And if, uh, kids, if you've never done this, then maybe this is a uh, fun Memorial Day thing that you can do. Um, super easy. Couple of cups, then you get like some string, connect these, and then here's, here's the trick though. What you have to do is you have to keep the line taut, and what's crazy is that through the wonder of science, this blew my mind as a kid, through the wonder of science, you could speak into the cup that would vibrate the cup, and then the, the, your, your voice, the vibrations that your voice makes would carry along the string to the other end, actually sending the sound of your voice through the other end of the cup. Real scientists are like, yeah, you kind of butchered that explanation. That's fine. You can correct me in the lobby, but it's close enough. <laughs> now, as a kid, this fascinated me. It was incredible. I mean, the fact that you could do this was pretty amazing. But I want you to understand, if you and I really knew to whom we were praying, if you and I really knew that, that Jesus was opening a door by which we would have a direct line to the God who created the universe, the God who, who knows you, the number of hairs on your head, the number of sands on the seashore, the God who is both infinite with absolute authority and yet intimately invites you to speak to him as your father in heaven. If you really knew that, would you speak? Would you speak more often? Would you actually take advantage of 
the fact that He listens to you? Would you take advantage of the fact that He wants you to talk to Him every day? Did you notice? Jesus said, you're praying for daily bread. When you pray every single day, your Father in heaven wants to hear from you. And it doesn't have to be from just one place. See, this is, this is the weakness of this illustration. It's kind of fun. It's kind of like, ooh, everybody got quiet to hear Taylor's tinny voice. But see, I have to come right here for this. And i got to keep the lines hot. And Patty's being awesome, trying to keep it over the microphone. But you and I need to understand we are given a relationship with God that is not limited. A frequency will not drop out. God will hear every word, every sigh, every cry. Because he's a father who loves you and cares. Thank, thank you, Patty. Now, if we can understand that, we can appreciate the rest of this prayer, which we'll move through more quickly. Because once we've acknowledged his greatness, this great, incredible God whose name is holy, meaning, man, we're, he's worthy of praise, he's worthy of reverence, he's worthy of us coming and saying, God, wow, you're amazing, you're incredible, you've made a way, and you're a father who loves me, who wants to hear from me, once, once we understand that and acknowledge his greatness, then we can confidently invite his rule. Prayer, it turns out, is not what sometimes I accidentally caught in prayer. I caught through some great passages in the New Testament about prayer that prayer was mainly about listing out all the things you wanted God to do, the people you wanted God to help, the the, the things you were hoping for, the, the interview that you were hoping would work out. These are not bad prayers. I want to make that very clear. But at the same time, I developed an immature prayer life in which my perspective on prayer growing up was that prayer was the setting in which I try to get God to do the stuff I hope he'll do for me. But when Jesus teaches us, how are we supposed to pray? that prayer is actually the setting in which we invite what God wants into our lives. I don't start with the list of my things. I actually start with God's agenda, his rule and reign. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this, this was a theme throughout Jesus' ministry, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The place where God rules and reigns. And, and every time he'd go to a new city, he started it at the beginning of his ministry and he did it over and over and over again. He would say, repent and believe the good news or gospel for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This was Jesus' way of say, saying, hey everybody, with all your individual kingdoms and all your individual agendas, good news, you can stop pretending to be king or queen because you don't have control over anything anyway. You can give up your agenda, you can trust me for mine, and through prayer, we are inviting God's rule on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, in heaven, God's presence is so powerful that angels and the heavenly hosts throw themselves on the floor saying, holy, holy, holy. They cannot help but live impacted by the presence of God. And when heaven comes to earth, when the Holy Spirit moves in our lives, we can't help but live impacted by the presence of God. When, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, man, there, there is, there's such potential in those words to see God breaking out his kingdom in and among us and through us and around us. And yet, those words offer both, they invite us to great sacrifice and to great hope. The sacrifice is in order for God's will to be done, his kingdom to come. Sometimes that means we need to go, okay, so I'm done with my version of being in charge. In fact, we need to pray like John the Baptist who said, he must increase, I must decrease. 
That's a hard prayer to pray when we've got our hands tightly wrapped around the things that we really want or the way we really want life to go. And yet, when we sacrifice and let go, we might actually experience the great hope, the great reward, which is to witness heaven breaking into earth as an answer to your prayers, even if they're prayers that have taken a lot longer to be answered than you hoped for. I appreciate, Patty, your help, but I also loved earlier this week getting to talk with you. See, when we, when we were talking, um, Patty was telling me about Wednesday nights with the kids over uh, here at NRH that there's been a recurring pattern of teaching on prayer this year which was awesome to hear some of the things that were taught about prayer, that God wants to hear us, that God cares about us, that he loves us, that he always has time for us, and that God speaks to us. But I also loved that Patty was willing to share some of her own personal journey with prayer. When Patty was eight years old, she realized that her dad was not a follower of Jesus. Patty was going to church. Patty loved God, prayed to God. And she desperately wanted her dad to have saving faith in Jesus. So she started praying. Boys and girls, listen. Your kids minister, Miss Patty, started praying when she was eight years old for her dad. And she prayed for her dad. And she prayed for her dad. And she prayed for her dad. And Months went by and years went by and decades went by, but she kept praying for her dad. And 26 years later, what started as as an eight-year-old girl culminated in her witnessing the answer to her prayers when her dad put on saving faith in Jesus and was baptized. Everybody... All children of God in the room, no matter your age, I want you to understand God hears our prayers. And when we pray into his will and his kingdom coming and heaven breaking into earth, we know we're praying on solid ground. And when we get to see that, we we go, oh, God, I want to go back to acknowledging your greatness. I want to sing what we sang this morning. Great is your faithfulness. Because once we've acknowledged his greatness, invited his rule, here's what it's time for each one of us to do. Surrender your life. I want you to notice in the prayer, this is where the pronouns change. Yes, I know a bunch of us just got out of school, so I'm not trying to do a grammar lesson, I promise. But the first part of the prayer, all the pronouns, pretty much referring to God, your name your kingdom, your will. But now we're going to see in the the second half of the prayer, contrary to the guilt that one person expressed thinking, I think I'm selfish for asking God for things. No, you're not. Jesus taught us to do it. Jesus actually wants us to pray about the things we need. But I want you to notice that it's from a posture of surrender. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, when when we look at this, we see that, that God really does care to hear about our spiritual, physical, and relational needs. God wants to hear. And you don't actually have to always pray these words. You might be praying something that really falls under the category of one of these. Something your family is is desperate for, and in that way, you're praying for daily bread. Something that you know you shouldn't have done, and in that way, you're lifting up repentance, saying, God, I need your forgiveness. Something that you're tempted by or struggling with trying to stand up under and saying, God, I need deliverance. But all of these are from the posture of, God, when your rule and reign come into my life, then that means I want to approach all of these as you would have me approach them. Enough of what I need just for today that I would be forgiving as I've been 
forgiving others. In fact, let's just touch that real quick, that tag that, that Jesus uses. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Makes me uncomfortable to read that. I would rather not have to take Jesus' words so seriously. In fact, when I, when I take his words seriously, one of the, the ways I'm tempted to read this is like, okay, Jesus, are you saying that we have to forgive other people so that we will be forgiven? Are you saying the act of forgiveness earns your forgiveness? Well, I don't think that's consistent with the witness of Scripture, even the teachings of Jesus. Because we don't, that one trap over on this side is legalism and thinking, oh, okay, I don't actually feel much love in my heart for that person. I don't like that person and I'm, I'm still mad about what that person did. But as long as I just speak forgiveness, then that's the magic key that unlocks that God will still forgive me. No, no, we're not going to manipulate God with our actions. But on the other end, the, the ditch we have to avoid and the trap we have to avoid is not actually caring about Jesus' words that were meant to forgive others. Now, when we live in the tension of what Jesus says, we have to realize when God's forgiveness has broken into our lives, when the kingdom has poured out grace uh, from heaven into earth in our lives, we cannot help but forgive others. When we understand how we've been forgiven, we can't help but become forgiving people. And if we pray to God, forgive us our sins, while we harbor unforgiveness against another, we are talking to God about something we don't understand. And God says, no, you, you need to sort that out with them first, because that's, that's the obedience I'm calling you to. Now, for, forgiven people forgive people. But here's what I want you to notice about this entire prayer. This is a prayer that anybody can pray. You can, pl you can pray this prayer when you are in a desperate place and you'll still experience something of the kingdom. Whether you're a single mom barely making ends meet, you can pray, give us this day our daily bread and you're gonna know God cares about your family being taken care of. The convicted felon can pray, forgive us our sins, and they're going to encounter the reality that God alone makes a way for forgiveness. The addict can pray, lead us not into temptation, and in doing that, they admit that achieving sobriety is only going to come from the higher power. But this is also a prayer that will impact and affect the powerful and the comfortable. Woman of influence cannot pray your kingdom come without facing the prospect that God may enlist her to help answer that very prayer through her influence, even if it costs her in her career or her reputation with others. A business owner cannot pray your will be done without surrendering their own agenda and yielding to God as the real one in charge. A suburban dad can't pray on earth as it is in heaven without looking at his surrounding community and asking, how can I love my neighbors in ways that give them a foretaste of heaven? And all of us, all of us in light of what this last season has looked like can pray, deliver us from the evil one. We have abundant evidence that we can't deliver ourselves. Man, from global events like Ukraine to national tragedies like Buffalo to things in our own state that we grieved this morning, there are too many more examples that we could name, but it is clear we need a deliverer. And when we pray, we are praying to the one who, the one who taught us this prayer came to earn our deliverance, to provide the healing, to break the chains and bonds of evil and sin, Jesus would go to the cross. He would 
die to pay for our sins. His body broken, his blood poured out. He would be buried three days later. He would raise by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in all of that, Jesus would win for us an ultimate deliverance because he's promised he will come back and set all things right. And there will be, there will be no more tragedies to mourn. There will be no more, no more cancer wards full of patients. There will be no more reasons to have to hide news bulletins from our, chil- our children. There will be no more crying or mourning or pain. And because of what Jesus has done, I believe we're praying to a God who listens and a God who responds. I want to tell you a short story as we wrap up of a way I saw that recently. I went across town and I was guest preaching at a church went to a men's breakfast on Saturday before I was going to preach on Sunday I was speaking at that men's breakfast and before the program started while breakfast was going on ran into a guy his name was D D and I start talking and he's got his backpack on and as our conversation winds down he goes well have a good one and he starts to leave and I said hey man did you know that there's actually like worship and I think somebody's going to speak here in just a little bit And uh, he said, oh, sorry, I didn't know. And I I confessed, I'm I'm actually the guest speaker this morning. He goes, oh, man. And he says, you know what, I'm I'm brand new. Actually, if he finds out I'm a pastor, he starts sharing. Like, he's like, man, I've actually been trying to get sober, trying to make some new new friendships, new relationships. And so I came this morning because I've been coming to this church. And, you know, I sat at a table and nobody talked to me. And I kind of just thought I was wasting my time. And I said, man, come, come sit with me. So he said, we, we go through the program. He was blessed by it. We got to pray together. And then I said, hey, tomorrow, man, just come say hi to me after service at some point. So I go on Sunday and, and I'm, I'm backstage and I walk by their baptistry and I just felt stirred and prayed and said, God, God, I don't know if there's somebody that, that it's time for heaven to break in to their life for them to respond and be baptized today. God, but if it's your will, would you, would you do it? Holy Spirit, would you move in their heart? Morning went on, services end, the, the day's winding down, and as the auditorium's empty, D walks up. He's got two of his sons and his nephew with him, and walk up and we start talking, and the family minister from the church is right there. And they'd met it the, the day before at breakfast, and D looked at the family minister and he said, hey man, I want you to know, next week, I've been thinking about it, and, and I'm ready. Next week, I'm gonna come forward to be baptized. I'll be looking for you. The family minister, he smiled. He said, dude, I love hearing that, but I got to ask, why next week? Why not today? And D smiled and he said, you know what? You're right, let's go. And he went and got changed. We witnessed him being baptized. His sons, his nephew watched this moment. And, and man, you could see this is something significant. There was a lot of emotion out of D as he got out of the baptism waters. He was smiling. He was crying. And, and I left. And as I left, I went backstage to get my Bible in my bag. And I walked back by that baptistry. And I said, God, you did it. You did it. But you know what? My favorite prayer answered that weekend wasn't mine. It was Saturday morning when D left a table where nobody was talking to him. And he got up and he just prayed a quick prayer to his Father in heaven. He said, God, if you really want me to stay here today, I need you to put somebody in my path. And then he ran right into the guest speaker. Like, that's how God works. He's listening to our prayers. He's a God who hears us. He's a God who loves us. He's a God who cares. So when you and I leave this place, this doesn't have to be the house of prayer. Wherever you are can be a house of prayer. Your car can be a place of prayer. Your living room can be a den of prayer. Man, we we as a people can continually be lifting up prayers that invite the kingdom into the world around us because when the kingdom breaks out, it's evident it's not us. It was him. It was his spirit. It was his power moving among us. And that is available in what Jesus taught us. So let's do it. In fact, Stan, let's let's read these words together and pray this prayer out loud. Read with me. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.